I'm honored, to, uh, I have been honored to, uh, to be asked to put on this presentation and hope that when, when I finish that you'll walk away with a piece of history, something that you'll remember about what we feel is an intricate part of Groton's history. For 25 years plus, the Coast Guard Training Station was here where we're all sitting. Very, very important part of our community. Uh, the men that, that served here uh, to defend our country, uh, we're very, very proud of. In checking with many people that were stationed here, there was no patch for the people stationed here. Everybody in today's world has a patch describes their facility or their operation. We believe that this was a decal that was used for the vehicles entering and departing the gate. It's the only one I've ever seen, and I'm fortunate to have it in my collection. I hope you don't go to sleep on this, but I think it's very, very important that you understand some history of the Coast Guard before we get into the training station. I won't read the, uh, everything to you, uh, but if you read the slides, you can see that in July of 1789, Congress passed the Tariff Act, which would provide a source of income to pay down the debt of the Revolutionary War and to raise revenues for the new government. Now, I found it very interesting in this, by the way, uh, that the taxes or duties uh, were on hemp, nail, glass, uh, earthenware, coffee, tea, and sugar, However, it was our first sin tax. All distilled spirits, beer and wine and ale were taxed. So that's where our sin tax came from. Then in August of 1790, uh, President Washington authorized construction of 10 vessels, cutters, to enforce the federal tariffs to prevent smuggling. Uh, Congress also authorized the Secretary of the Department of the Treasury to create a maritime service to enforce custom laws. So that pretty much was the beginning. And then we have the U.S. Life Saving Service. And they, these are private individuals that would dedicate themselves to go out and rescue shipwrecks, passengers from shipwrecks, as well as the supplies or the uh, property that was being shipped. And in 1878, President he uh, Haynes, Hayes uh, signed a bill officially establishing the U.S. Life Service. Uh, if you go to some of these facilities where there's lighthouses, you'll see small buildings where the boats used to go out with the crews and actually go over these huge waves to go out and, and rescue these people. January 28, 1915, Congress passed an act that merged, merged the Revenue Cutter Service with the Life Saving Service, forming the United States Coast Guard. So if you look at that, it's 1915. That's only 100 years. All right. But if you go back even further, we also have these other services that were involved. We have the Lighthouse Service. Convoluted uh, as far as changing hands, they found that uh, there was a little bit of hanky-panky going on with the, with the finances. So ultimately, in June 1910, Congress abolished the Lighthouse Board and created the Bureau of Lighthouses to have complete charge of the Lighthouse Services. Now, to even add more bureaucratic things to it, we have a Steamboat Inspection Service. Now, that was created in uh, 1852 to provide regulations to safeguard lives and properties on sea of steam vessels. Along with that, we established in 1884 laws concerning construction, equipment, operation, inspection, safety, and documentation of merchant vessels. Does it sound familiar? We're into that bu bureaucratic system. Well, at one point, they said this is too convoluted, it's too bureaucratic. So, in 1932, the Steamboat Inspection Service and the Bureau of Navigation were combined to form the Bureau of uh, Marine Navigation and Steamboat Inspection. In 1946, the functions of the Bureau of Marine Navigation and Steamboat Inspections were transferred to the United States Coast Guard. But we're going back to 1790. That's where we first started with the tariff, the Bureau of Tariff. So that's where we start our 225th anniversary. Okay. Is that enough? We're at a university. 
we have to educate people. That's what we did. We brought you up to speed, so let's get to Groton. That's what we're all here for. There were increases in staffing anticipated because of the oncoming war. Now, the training requirements for the Coast Guard were petty officers, very important to that service. Now, they trained 950 a year, with seven or 475 of them being trained at one time. Now, recruits of apprentice seamen, the replacement of 2,300 sailors a year, with 560 of them being trained at one time. Now, the growing branch, as, as you saw, uh, of the nature and duties of the Coast Guard uh, required training units for, uh, for the skills needed in the technical areas, especially for the enlisted personnel. The training could not be handled by the present facilities that they had in the Coast Guard. And for the sake of economy and prudent administration, one central unit was required. Now, why Groton? The Coast Guard had no suitable site available uh, to develop all the different classes that they had to have. Although we had a presence at Fort Trumbull in New London and the Coast Guard Academy in New London, there was no capacity for expansion. In fact, Fort Trumbull, because it was built on ledge, they just couldn't get down to build the foundations for the buildings that were needed. And of course, like other things, politics behind the scenes. And this is interesting because it was very helpful to us. Fortunate for us, our Connecticut representatives in Washington, as well as the state governmental officials, were lobbying to bring the facility here to Groton. Now, I don't know the specific department because we're going back to the 19, late 1930s, but a state department called the Commission of Steamship Terminal, which is, uh, well, it was actually the Commissioner of the Steamship Terminal Department of the State of Connecticut, was negotiating with the estate of Henry B. Plant. And that name we'll bring up again to purchase this facility and in turn donate it. They were, they were negotiating for the state of Connecticut, by the way. And if they purchased it, they were going to donate it to the United States of America for the purpose of building the training station. Now, we all looked at our Brantford uh, house. Uh, we've all looked at our facilities here at the Avery Point uh, campus. Uh, which was the Plant Estate. Morton Plant built this, the mansion, in 1903. The mansion cost $3 million. There were 71 acres of land that came along with this, as well as other buildings. When the uh, terminal department purchased it, the steamship terminal, it sold for $85,000. What a deal. But it was uh, to our favor. Now, the gift from the state of Connecticut, that's what we're going to talk about. Commodore Morton Plant, the Avery Point Estate. This was, this was his summer resort. By the way, in research in Morton Plant, he spent an average of 30 days here. And the mansion, he had 58 people on staff year round to take care of the facility. Anyway, Here's an older picture of Morton Plant's estate. And I'm going to try to orient you. This is the mansion. These are his gardens. This is Shinnecasset Road. This is Shinnecasset Beach. And by the way, this is Shinnecasset Yacht Club. You notice there's no dock. Prior to Mr. Plant building this facility, uh, the land was owned by an Everett Spicer. He ran a farm here. Next to him was his brother, John, who had a farm 
there. If you look at the Shanacosset Yacht Club building, that was the old farmhouse. There was a fire there, but part of the structure still there. That was the farmhouse. Along, along with the uh, 71 acres was the mansion. And now we have the, uh, the keeper's superintendent's house. It's now the police department here. If you look at this, this is taken from Shanacosset Road. These are the stables. They're now the facilities, uh, uh, the director of facilities. Uh, that's where he's located. Morton Plant had several steamships, and this was his boathouse, and dock. This is the bungalow. Let me get that over with now. Uh, some people have heard about uh, Morton Plant's second marriage to a uh, uh, man wearing who had a son, and the son was adopted by Morton Plant, Philip Manwaring Plant, sort of like a playboy. He married a movie star named Constance Bennett. They uh, spent one night in the bungalow. She did not care for it, and the bungalow was never used again. Right. It was torn down by the Coast Guard, by the way. So, uh, Mr. Plant had several greenhouses and gardens. If you look at this garden here and here, Go to the mansion and look directly across the street where that building is. That's where this particular garden was located. Had a pool. Unbelievable. Everything was imported from Italy. Marble from Italy. Wood from Italy. Uh, it was just money was no object with Mr. Plant. Now we go to the transition. Actually, the facility was placed into operation in August of 1942. Uh, the state of Connecticut did deed the property to the United States government. When the Coast Guard came here, they uh, added 31 more buildings to the facility. The mansion was now converted into the commander's residence. And remember I mentioned I, I spoke with the a classmate whose father was a commander here. The commander lived on one half, and the deputy commander, I don't know what his rank was, lived on the second half, on the second floor. These are some of the classrooms that were constructed. That's the one that's right across the street from the, from the mansion. That's the one that's been in the process there, uh, considering demolition of that. Uh, which will probably take place in talking to the facilities manager probably sometime uh, this winter. They needed barracks for the, for the men. Now remember my swearing or my sailor talk, well you talk about taking 71 acres and putting stuff into it. They made it happen. Those are the barracks for the, for the men stationed here. I remember them when I was on the police department. I remember there uh, and I know the former fire chief is here also, Bill Scarano, and there was a, a couple of fires, major fires in those buildings because they were wooden structures. When the Coast Guard first came here, uh, they wanted a budget of $3.5 million to construct the facility. They were granted $1.9 million. So instead of permanent facilities, the classrooms were made out of cinder block and the barracks were made out of uh, wooden structures. The Institute, the Coast Guard had, and, and I believe still does, a correspondence uh, facility for correspondence schools for all of the, all of the rates, uh, all of the specialties that they have in the, in the uh, Coast Guard. Uh, take correspondence schools. This is where the library is uh, presently located uh, on campus. This is probably my worst photograph, I'm sorry. Okay. Now, we talk about, and, and you'll see a little later. Uh, I was in the Army, and the, they always said the Army moved on their stomachs. Well, the Coast Guard did too, believe me. Uh, but this was their, their mess hall, their galley. <laughs> For those that live in Groton, why do we have three police departments? Why do we have three governments? Why do we have eight fire departments? We had more than eight fire departments. We had another one here. All right. But it was needed. And they did have some full-time firemen, 
uh, sailors that were firemen. But they, uh, another requirement was that they had duty. If you had duty at night, you would be assigned to the fire department and you would sleep there. And if there was a fire, you responded with a full-time fireman. And they were located in what is presently the uh, uh, facilities building. And if you notice in the background, this was a major component of the firefighting apparatus, was the water tower that was here. Several stories about it. Um, I, I, when I was on the police department, I, I have a tremendous fear of heights, by the way. If you put me on top of this podium, you will call me Spider-Man because I will cling right to it. We had some teenagers go up there one night and I had to go up and bring them down. I went home immediately afterwards and had a couple of cups of coffee. We'll say coffee. I, I find this photograph interesting. This is the Coast Guard right after they came here and they're moving plants. Now remember all those gardens. Remember uh, all the greenhouses. They were torn down. They were bulldozed down. A lot of the uh, marble was used as riprap around the, uh, uh, the facility uh, by the water. But they, Morton Plant did import trees from around the world. And so this is one that's being replanted, and that's, again, across the street from the mansion. Now, I was very fortunate that I, I met a gentleman, uh, and we'll talk about him a little later, uh, who provided me this photograph, which was in one of the newspapers. These are the plank, plank owners. These are the groundbreakers. There's, uh, I think there's 11 people there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine people in that photograph. Those are the first nine enlisted men that were stationed here. They did the organizing as far as what, where we're going to put it and how we're going to put it. And then, of course, they were followed up with 50 more that enlisted men that came, and then another 75. But these are the plank owners. And for years, beginning in the 70s, they would have reunions, and they continued until the 80s, uh, when a few of them started passing away. Now, important thing. When, the deed, when, the Connecticut, when Connecticut deeded the property to the United States of America, there was a major requirement. And I'm glad there was a major requirement in it, because I became intimately involved in it. When they did that, the property was transferred, especially in consideration of the promise of the United States of America to erect and maintain on or over the land hereafter described beacon lights or other buildings and apparatus to be used in aid of navigation. Folks, that's a lighthouse. And that's what we have here. That was the lighthouse. And if you look carefully at the bottom of it, you'll see a ladder. They just finished this. So this photograph was taken probably in 1942. Now, this was an old newspaper. Even though the lighthouse was built and ready to go, they did not activate the lighthouse until May of 1944 for war considerations, because they didn't want it flashing. They didn't want attention brought to it. So the lighthouse was completed. They had fulfilled the requirement of their deeds, and uh, that lighthouse still exists today. Schools and facilities. This is unbelievable. What I found was I, I, it just amazed me. These are some some of the schools. Now look through them. They even had an academy preparation school here where you would prep for it. I have one photograph of that. Uh, aids to navigation. You just go through the, the whole thing. I, I've highlighted or, or put asterisks next to two of them. Pharmacist school. These schools would last anywhere from two to 32 weeks. The pharmacist school was the longest one. That was the 32-week school. And you see that virology? Does anybody know what virology is? I do. Lighthouse engineering. Only one in the world was here in Groton. And that was like a uh, six-week uh, class. Carpenter's Mate School. Uh, you look at that, what they're constructing there. Looks more like a house, doesn't it? I wonder how many people were trained here that now became contractors. Probably quite a few people. Gunner's Mate. As you came into this facility, into the Avery Point property, if you look to the right, there's a building that looks like a half an A-frame. That was the Gunner Mate School. And if you go inside, it's completely dark. Right? 
And they would put movies up there of planes coming in. And they would practice dry runs with, with, the, with, the, with the gun that you're seeing right there. And as a side order, uh, when I was on the police department, I never participated in it. Larry Garrish is here, and I know he uh, was on the police pistol team. There supposedly was a pistol range in that building also that was used by Coast Guard men as well as the police department who uh, competed against each other in pistol matches. Signal schools. You know, today's world where we have all the technology with the phones and, and lasers and things of this nature, used to be done with flags. And you see the box on the left with the different flags. And they would teach these uh, sailors for two to three weeks on signals so they could pass messages along uh, between ships. Electrician mate, on every ship, ele electronics is extremely important. But look at some of the old equipment there uh, being replaced today. Probably the machine at the lower, uh, lower left here is probably now, just like our computers, probably the size of, a, of a, a little tablet or a mouse. Remember I said about going on your own stomach? There was a gentleman that was here that was in charge of the school. His name was Ken Perry. Ken Perry became the, uh, ultimately became the manager of the Elks Club in Groton. And he provided me with these pictures many, many years ago. Uh, but they taught them how to cut meats and then, of course, how to bake. And uh, he, several other photos and some of the bakery, I, I wish I could jump into the photograph and eat it because it was unbelievable. There's the pharmacy school. Uh, there's several other photographs I have of the pharmacy school. I didn't include it, but it was just like going to a, a nursing school. Uh, they had skeletons, they, uh, chemistry, you name it, they had it. But again, the longest school that they had. There's the Academy Preparation School. In my research, they would start off, just like the Navy SEALs, they would start off with like 290 recruits. And by the time it got down, there may be 14 people that were eligible for exception at the Academy. Now, whether they all were accepted, I don't know. But you went from 290 down to 14 people. That was a very rigorous school to go through. Now, we talked about the school, but let's, let's talk about some of the statistics about the school. There were 12 to 30 schools and, and special courses were conducted at one time, at one time. So there were various schools, but at one time they'd have about anywhere from 12 to 30 schools going on. Courses of schools were from two to 32 weeks. I already mentioned that. An average of 2,500 men graduated from the schools and courses each year. That will tell you how many people were on this facility. There was a staff of over 110 instructors. An average of 800 to 1,700 men lived at the station at one time. Now, the instructors and some of the other higher petty officers could live off base. So some of our housing developments that we have, Brantford Avenue, Lytton Avenue, uh, Bill Avenue, we had a lot of Coast Guard men living there. The Institute uh, administered over 100 courses with a staff of 80 men. That's, that's a lot of work for 80 men. Because there were 8,500 students a year that took courses and completed them. And I found this just before I finalized the thing. An average of 20 or 2,000 reservists completed their six month active duty requirement here at the station. So now if you take the 2,000 and add it to the 1,700 and then add it to the 100 and add it to the, to the 80, you can see how many people we had stationed here at one time. It was a major facility. Now, support and uh, special activities go along with any facility, with any school. The personnel office, by the way, was in the lower floor of the mansion. And if you look in the background, you can see some of the, uh, the wood design. I had another one that showed the, <laughs> one of the fireplaces, and I'm wondering if some of the sailors might not have started a fire to keep warm during the winter. Payroll. Now, today's world, we get a check. We all wait for that check, or it goes to the credit union or the bank. 
Uh -uh. When I was in the military, and most of you were in the military, you got cash. You, and once a month, you went and stood in line, and you got your cash. Well, the next picture, the guy in the background is making sure he's going to get his cash. <laughs> of course, like any, any other community, you have to have barber shops. Where you're wearing uniforms, you have to have tailor shops, and they did have them here. More importantly, this is way back when, I would say probably 95% of the sailors smoked. So this was a very important store. And if you look in the background, you'll see all the cartons of cigarettes, you see the pipes. So this was a, this was a major store for the, for the people that were stationed here. They had their own print shop. Remember, we have a, 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 a correspondence school here. They're putting out newsletters, they're putting out uh, all their school materials. So they had their own print shop. They have a drafting shop. Now, my wife and I have had a discussion about this. It's important that we have a drafting shop. But I look careful, very careful. And I call it the morale shop. Because you see what he was drawing? OK? Now, my, my wife says it's a uniform. I argued, but. I, uh, of course, I won't win. <laughs> they had their own course, which we go throughout the community. This was provided to me by uh, a, a schoolmate. His father was in that course. A dance band. Uh, they had several dances, especially fundraising dances. Uh, remember Plants Boathouse? Well, it became the CPO, Chief Petty Officers Club. Larry, you remember this. I remember it. You used to go in there. And you can see the sign up front on top. I was going to show you a picture of the building, but I could only find one. It was taken in 1954, right after a hurricane. But I'm sure it was repaired very quickly and at no cost, except for maybe a beer or so. For the, the carpenter mates, I'm sure the carpenter mates came in and helped with that. That is now. Well, there's the inside of it. I remember sitting at one of those tables, by the way. Having coffee. <laughs> there is now the Project Oceanography building. This is another poor photograph that came out of a, um, a newspaper. Uh, canteen, Grogan's Grill. I knew it as the Gee Dunk. They called it the Gee Dunk. Uh, this is where the sailors would get sodas and hot dogs and hamburgers. Uh, I remember this because this is what an important part of me remembering the Coast Guard training station. When I grew up, um, my, one of my best friends, his grandmother ran the Gee Dunk. And we would come down after high school and help the grandmother. And this picture here is a postcard picture of the Gee Dunk. That's Mrs. Denise. That's the grandmother. That is my friend, one of my friends. This is my best man, the other friend, best man at my wedding. I swear this is me, but my wife says it's too good looking to be me. <laughs> right? But I share that picture because it brought back a lot of memories uh, and my personal thoughts as far as the Coast Guard uh, training station. Now, always the military, school or no school. I went to a military school. But you still had to do formations. You still had inspections. There's a full formation. Uh, some of you people saw the enlargement of the photograph over the uh, Branford House. And you can see the barracks in, in the back. That's the only room they had. That was their parade ground. Of course, inspections. Shine those shoes. Make sure your pants are creased and all that. And they had a band here, a marching band uh, that participated in all this. And they also participated in community events, parades. Uh, they would put on concerts. Now, let me get to you some interesting stories and tidbits. Um, I hope you like them. I do. Remember the, the lighthouse? Well, they had. Uh, I think it was the gunnery school. 
used to practice with dynamite, T-N-T, dynamite. And they would go to the submarine base and acquire their dynamite. State requirement, you have to have a bunker to store the dynamite. There was no bunker available except for the lighthouse. That was the bunker for the dynamite. Thank goodness it didn't explode. However, boom, I found this article in the newspaper. Uh, this in the 1950s, somebody in New London heard a loud explosion, looked toward Groton, and saw smoke, and thought that either there had been an explosion or a plane crash at the Groton airport. But it wasn't. It was just the gunnery people having their fun out on Pine Island, right off our little Branford house here, is where they did the explosions or did the uh, demolition work. And while we're talking about the lighthouse, because it is important to me, there are other people in the audience uh, that helped considerably. Uh, they are instrumental. After the Coast Guard closed, the university took over. Unfortunately, very little maintenance or upkeep was done to the lighthouse from 1967. And then in 1997, this is what the lighthouse looked like. Fortunately, the group worked hard uh, with the cooperation of uh, the University of Connecticut and the American Lighthouse Foundation in six years and a half a million dollars later, we now have our Avery Point Lighthouse. This, by the way, if you look down the road, 15, 20 years from now, when the university completes their project and demolishes all the old Coast Guard buildings that were expected to last 15 years when they were built in 1942, when those are demolished, this building will probably be the only building that the Coast Guard built that will remain on campus. So we're proud of that. The chapel. Anybody recognize that? You probably don't, because you're probably used to seeing this portion of the mansion. The mansion was built in 1903, and in 1907, Mr. Plant built a music room, and that was his music room. And when the Coast Guard uh, came here, they converted it into their non-denominational chapel. Beautiful facility. One of my classmates was married in there, and that's what the inside looked like. Now, the story behind the chapel, in 1963, there was a major fire. Now, it's all wood inside, remember. Even though we have granite on the outside, wood on the inside. That includes your... Your basement, et cetera, it's all wood. Major fire, destroyed the building. However, the Coast Guard collected the money, uh, raised the monies, and rebuilt it in 1965. Unfortunately, again, they moved out in 1967. Preventative maintenance uh, was lacking of sorts, and in 1992, the termites had destroyed the building and it had to be raised. So that's why you no longer see the chapel. When, when it was here, many of the sailors used it as a background for their graduating classes. Beautiful building, absolutely gorgeous. And by the way, the granite used there is the same granite that was used in constructing the Branford House. Yes, that's a ping pong table. And yes, those are ping pongs. Now you're saying, what the hell does ping pong tables and ping pongs have to do with the United States Coast Guard training station? <laughs> Let me show you this. I found this. This is their, one of their station papers from 1943, January 1943. There has been considerable disappointment over the fact that there have been no ping pong balls available at the recreation center during the past few days. An adequate supply of these balls, which are now on the priority list. This is, a, this is a military facility. You would think guns and butter would be more important than ping pong balls, but they weren't. So I found this. I thought you might enjoy hearing that ping pong balls are very important to sailors. This is the plan of state well. 
They actually acquired water from it. This is how it looked when Morton Plant was there. And by the way, I want you to take a look at that flagpole. Right there. That's the same flagpole that's in front of the Branford house. It was moved by the Coast Guard to the front of the Branford house. And here's, here's some interesting facts. The reason why it was moved is because the location it is in is the highest level of property on the estate. Number one. Number two, when they moved it, they placed it in five and a half feet of cement to keep it from blowing over. And when they did, they put a time capsule in it with the first issue of the training station newsletter. And if anybody can answer this question, let me know, because I can't find the answer. And a dollar and 35 cents in coins. Have no idea why. None. Right? But if we ever dig it up, those coins, I'd like to see them. I really would. Anyway, when the Coast Guard was here, this is a, sort of a terrible picture, but if you look at his hand, he's got a 50 cent piece. It became their wishing well. Wishing to graduate from a school, wishing to receive the next highest rank, and it all went into the well. Many of the sailors had their photographs taken there uh, when they graduated from school. And this is what the well looks like today. And the facility manager, Ben, he and I have dibs on this. Okay, we're going to get our metal detectors. We have first dibs on the well, all right? Some dignitary attention, like any other military. Remember the Army had Elvis Presley and all those, and, right? How about that? Bing Crosby on Groton's map. There he is, Groton Station News. That was one of the newspapers that was produced here at the station. And there's Bing Crosby reading it. I don't know if it's prop or what, but I've got a picture of Bing Crosby with a Groton connection. Gentleman on the left, Aaron Robinson. You see his uniform? Coast Guard Training Station. He was a, he was a Yankee, and then he served two years, and he went back to the Yankees. There he is here with Ralph Hawk. Hawk used to be the coach of the Yankees, and Yogi Berra. And I'm not sure, I tried to trace whether he played Yogi Berra when Yogi Berra was stationed at the submarine base. Now, somebody came to me, oh, Arnold Palmer was here. Arnold Palmer played golf here. Let me dispel that. As best as I can determine, he was not here. He was stationed in Maryland. He, uh, his position was he was a, ph a photographer, and he used to take the identification pictures for all the sailors that were in the 9th District of the Coast Guard, which is down in the Maryland area. Uh, and we have no records whatsoever of him coming here or playing at Shenacosset Yacht or Shenacosset Golf Club. A memorial at Avery Point. There is an important memorial here. Let me orient you. This is the walkway. This is Shenacosset Beach. This is the west side of the campus. See this here? That's our memorial. Duffy, Bosa Mate's first class, U.S. Coast Guard mascot, died January 2, 1947. For years, when we restored the lighthouse, we wanted to know about Duffy. We put it in our newsletter asking for any information. We checked newspapers, we checked everything, could find nothing. And then, oh, probably three years after we started the lighthouse, I'm having breakfast at one of the local restaurants, and an older woman came up to me and said, you're Mr. Strader, aren't you? Yeah. You're a historian, aren't you? Yeah. Uh, you took care or helped build the lighthouse. Yep. Uh, I've got a story I bet you don't know about. I said, what's that? And she says, do you know about Duffy? And my ears perked. And she said, my husband knows all about Duffy. And I kind of gingerly said, is he still alive? <laughs> yes. An hour later, my wife and I were in that home, and he was immobile, sitting in the chair, hard of hearing, but we're yelling at each other. But we're getting through. And uh, remember the picture? Of, well, I'll show you the picture. He was stationed here. He was part of the security detachment. And Duffy was attached to the security detachment. It was their mascot. 
And he said, I said, what do you look like? Ah, a little short, stocky thing, mongrel, uh, you know, kind of fat, but he had a wart on his side. He says, you know what we used to do? Every morning we'd go over to the mess hall and get him a plate of sausage or, or bacon. I said, no wonder the damn thing was fat. <laughs> so anyway, he said, yeah, he used, to, he used to march with us in parades, go to inspections with us. I said, you've got to be kidding me. Nope. Well, he said he had a picture, and he had a picture of him in uniform. Uh, the wife said they would try to get their son to go up in the attic. Three, four years later, we never came up with a picture. However, one of those newspapers came about. And actually, it was that, it was that yearbook that came about. Oh, by the way, somebody every year erects flags and puts flowers on that gravestone. Don't know who. Guess what? Look to the right, folks. There is Duffy. Right? And for those that can't see it, there's Duffy. Right? And then recently, in one of those newspapers, there was articles about, an article about uh, uh, Coast Guard mascots, and there's Duffy in uniform. Right? Now, the shuttering. It closed October 1st, 1967, and this is the flag lower ceremony that particular day. Uh, and I, I mentioned this to somebody uh, this evening. By the 1960s, early 60s, the buildings uh, needed replacement and upgrading. Um, and they were, they were looking for funding of about $5 million to do this. Uh, well, unfortunately, uh, they said no. But we were talking about the BRAC, the realignment thing with the military bases that, have, that Groton has been involved in for the last 10 years, with the, especially the Navy base. Well, in November of 1964, the United States First Army Unit vacated the facilities on Governor Island. And this was part of the Department of Defense cost-saving effort just like BRAC is to us. <laughs> Try to figure out the government. March 18, 1965, a decision was made to move the Coast Guard training station to Governor's Island. So what did we save? Well, we saved the facility here, I guess. I guess it was a wash, because they moved the Army facility and they moved the Coast Guard facility. By the way, the Institute moved to Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. This is pretty much what the Coast Guard facility looked like when it closed. It's a, uh, a postcard of it. Now, I came across this letter. Remember I said they, they met every year, they had that uh, groundbreaking thing? Well, in 1978, a former reverend uh, from the chapel wrote a letter because he couldn't attend. And in his words, not only was the location a place of thrilling beauty, but after the brick and mortars and mud stage was over, a spirit developed that made the station something more than a collaboration of building and training schools. The place became the center of a way of life, especially for those who were more permanently stationed there. It took on the character of a living institution more resembling an ivory-covered college than a center to train men of war. The spirit that makes the Coast Guard different from all the other services permeated the place. There was a sense of intimacy, of family feeling, of loyalty, together with a sense of assurance of having been there and knowing what had to be done and be being able to do it. The spirit accompanied the men when they went away from Avery Point to do other tasks. Now, to end this presentation, about a month and a half ago, somebody said, you want to go up to the Fairview facility and speak with a gentleman that's up there. He's a former Coast Guard uh, uh, band member who was stationed at the Coast Guard uh, Academy, but also traveled to this facility in Groton many times. And before we even talk about that, we'll talk about the university. The university, what, had not, what we lost with the, with the training station was actually an ending to a good beginning because now we have the Coast Guard 
it, now we have the University of Connecticut here, and it's a booming school. Let me tell you, it is well recognized throughout the country, and I'm sure it's going to be doing even better. But I'm going to go back to the guy at the, at the uh, Fairview. There he is, Mr. Ray Welch. <laughs> when I went up there, he was eating lunch with his wife. He lives there with his wife. And I told him who I was, and I was doing research. And she said, what'd he say? And then I went through it again. I don't want you talking to him. <laughs> so one of the nurses came over and says, don't worry. He goes over and plays the piano after he eats. You can go talk to him then. Well, he did. And the piano was terrible. The keys were stuck down. The pedal was stuck. And he played beautiful piano. And I asked him if he knew the Coast Guard theme, and he played the Coast Guard theme just like it was nothing, and it was beautiful. I was going to play it here tonight, but we didn't really have time or the facility to do it. And by the way, this gentleman is 100 years old. All right? And before I left, I mentioned about the 225th anniversary, and this is what he said. Semper Paratus. Happy 225th anniversary. And that's what I'm saying, plus I'm saying good night. Thank you.